I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. We are going to have a lively discussion tonight with two very hard-working priests who are great friends and old friends of the network. You may recognize them from their shows, Web of Faith, where they addressed viewer emails on a wide variety of topics on the Catholic faith, and they did so with lots of knowledge, wisdom and compassion, and of course, humor that really only believers can have. And then you may also remember their crash course in Catholicism. <laughs> they didn't really crash, but they did present the basics of Catholic belief and practice in terms anybody could understand and they always would include a how-to segment on what to do as a Catholic. How do you do all this stuff as a Catholic? Well, they are now giving us a new and more recent offering called Catholic Blitz. It is a collection of short, under a minute expert answers to common questions of faith. So please welcome the Vice Rector of the Pontifical College Josephinum, Father Kenneth Briganti, and the Mount St. Mary's Seminary Spiritual Director and Formation Advisor, Father John Trigilio. Father Ken, welcome back. Good Thank to you. have you, Father John. Father Mitch. Good to see you. Good to see you both. So, you behaving? Yeah, well, we <laughs> well, tried. <laughs> it's a relative term. I don't recall asking that. <laughs> I asked if you are. <laughs> so, how are things over at the Josephinum? Uh, very well. Uh, I just started there in August, mm -hmm. and uh, great rector, Father Pesso, uh, uh put a great team together, and uh, working with the men on the theology side, we have a college too. Yes, yes. And then uh, next year, we're gonna be starting what they call the propedeutic year, and I will be doing seminars with the vice rector of the college seminary in, the, in that. It's sort of the year before they enter philosophy mm -hmm. or uh, before they enter college, depending on the age they come in. Sure. And, uh, and it's just a year in which they uh, um, just uh, center in on the human dimension, the spiritual dimension, and the pastoral dimension. The, uh, there's very little on the intellectual side. There are some intellectual uh, sure. courses they'll take, like the catechism class, but that's not the highlight. The highlight is to prepare them in the other dimensions in their uh, priestly ministry that they will hopefully will go for. And then when they finish that, then they'll go to more academic courses. Then they'll either go into the philosophy if they had a college degree, or they'll go into the college seminary if they came out of high school. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Father John Trigilio, how do you like it over there at Mount St. Mary's? We're doing well. We're almost at full capacity. We have 156 uh, seminarians this past year. Nice. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then we're also branching out, too, because of the propedeutic year. So there's a whole wing uh, at the, down the street from us. Some uh, mm -hmm. sisters, uh, daughters of Christian charity, have uh, their old mother house there. And so they're... Uh, giving us access to a whole wing for our propedeutic. Mm -hmm. And then we don't have a college seminary like they do with the Josephinum, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to have a propedeutic and then our f regular four year uh, seminary program. Okay, okay. But it sounds like young men are coming to your seminaries? Yes. Yeah. And they come to each one from different parts of the country. That's not a, se neither one is a seminary for one particular diocese. No, we actually also have religious communities that are sending uh, uh -huh. to, we, we have the, uh, uh, the Mercy Fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, so they uh, actually have a priest there on, on our staff uh, that um, helps, directs their uh, seminarians, but he also works in the pastoral field department too. For the whole seminary. Okay. And we have a few other religious communities that are sending their Mercedarians mm -hmm. uh, as well, and um, plus different dioceses mm -hmm. through the Midwest and South. Even Birmingham, right here, sends many yes, of their men here. Yes, it does. Yeah. It does. To both the college and the uh, theologate. Yep. Yep. I've yep. had a number of young men go there. Yeah, and the same for uh, Mount St. Mary's. Oh, yeah. Before. We have about 23 dioceses that, mm -hmm. that send to us. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's important, I think, for folks to understand that there are a lot of young men, you know, coming into seminaries, and there are other seminaries that are also quite full, you know, in, in different parts of the country. Um, some of the seminaries are 
quite full, not all, but it, it really does seem to me that the more fully and authentically Catholic a seminary is, the more men are attracted to study. Would that be a fair statement? Absolutely. Uh, the men come in with a, a good evangelical heart, they, a pastoral heart. Uh, they want to be a priest in the 21st century, rooted and grounded in sacred tradition mm -hmm. uh, of, our, of our faith. And, uh, and this is how they're coming to us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we're just helping them uh, continue into, in the four dimensions, intellectual as well, uh, to, to uh, help them in the different stages to get to holy orders. And the early stages is called the discipleship stage. It's, they're still discerning whether they're gonna uh, continue on. And mm -hmm. then the configuration stage, the theology stage, uh, they are, are making more of a commitment. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the last stage, which I think is, will be done more in the parishes, is called the vocational synthesis stage. That's where they'll be, uh, eventually will they be ordained a deacon at that stage. Uh, so uh, the, they're coming into the seminary with uh, uh, real zeal and apostolic zeal. And uh, it's very, uh, for us older guys, uh, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's very inspiring to see that. Well, you know, I, I entered uh, minor seminary. I, <laughs> I started seminary when the council, Vatican Council was still going on. Wow. Back in 1963 is when I started. My class had 530 some guys in it. Wow. And out of them, only 38 were ordained priests including two of us who are Jesuits and one who's a Benedictine. And we, you know, back, f for those of us who entered seminary in the 60s, we watched a decline. There, there, that was a time of lots and lots of uh, priests leaving in big numbers. I think there were about, about 20,000 who yeah. left, something, you know, in, in the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, it, it got to be a bit of a concern you know, said, am I going to be the one who, you know, goes down with the ship? Or am I the one who turns out the lights when everybody else is gone? I mean, yeah, you know, this kind of jokes that were the, the nervous humor uh, right before the gallows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it's really been turning around. Yes. And I think that's another factor, especially since, you know, uh, we are now well past the uh, sex abuse scandal, and that hasn't stopped these young men from coming in, has no, it? No, not at all. Uh, that's what's really inspiring is, in spite of all the bad publicity that is out there in the media, uh, young men are still, they're feeling the call, uh, and, the, and they're coming into the center. Sometimes their parents are not all on board, uh, but eventually, uh, many of them do, and mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but they are there, and uh, and they're committed to to uh, to discern the Lord's will for them. And uh, yeah, in spite of all of the bad publicity, we're still getting men. We had pretty big come and see programs from mm -hmm. different dioceses already. Uh, the prospects, uh, some of them already graduated from college. They have engineering degrees. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they'll be entering more of the philosophy, the philosophy stage sure. and then the theology stage. But it's very inspiring to see how many young people, uh, young men are, are uh, answering the call, to at least try it out. And in, in, I had uh, Bill uh, Donahue on my program last mm -hmm. year. And he was talking about how actually we've done better than most other segments of society in regarding to the issues of the sex scandal and the sexual abuse. We've moved, we've done lots of things to try to address, to address it pretty successfully. And now we are moving on to rebuilding. And that, that's what it sounds like you're doing at the seminary. Oh yeah, I would say that the, um, ability to, to observe what's going on and because all the seminarians know how to report things. Uh, I was in, the, I went to high school seminary in 1976. Mm -hmm. Back then you wouldn't dare say anything to anybody because you know, you were just afraid. Uh, now we have a system set up of who to report mm -hmm. if it's a priest, even if it's a bishop, there's a plan set. And then we tell them also when they go to a parish uh, to make sure that, you know, everything transparency is, is out there so that, you know, if anything funny happens, uh, things are going to get reported to the civil authorities as well as the uh, 
ecclesiastical ones, but uh, like Father Ken was saying, uh, you know, right after the, the Cardinal McCarrick report, the grand jury report, we thought for sure there'd be a dip in uh, seminary enrollment. It was the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw a surge because guys said, we don't want this to happen again. Right. And they, they, that, I think, is an important part of this. They don't want to see, and they, they're saying, I'm willing to step into yeah. the breach. I'm going to be one of the guys that says, we're going to, and quite frankly, we've had very, very few new cases. Sometimes old ones still come up, but very few new. The guys are not focused on that. They're focused on, how do I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do I serve his church? How do I help folks who are hurting? That's the focus and not, you know, this other uh, problem. And the seminary is a healthier environment now. In what uh, way? Well, um, especially after Pastor Double Volbis, uh, Pope uh, St. John Paul II's great document mm -hmm. on restructuring mm -hmm. the seminaries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so really, um, we owe a total bit of gratitude to him. Uh, uh, and so the, the seminaries are structured in a very healthy way. Uh, they promote spirituality. We have, like back in the day when we went to, to seminary, there was no exposition, uh, even once a month. Now there's exposition of the Blessed Sacrament every day. Uh, and, uh, um, and we ask if they have a Marian devotion. Uh, and uh, so all of these things are, uh, their spiritual life is what is concern, what we have a concern for. Uh, and there are great talks uh, and seminars on celibacy. I remember when I went to uh, college seminary and major seminary, if I heard two talks on celibacy, <laughs> that that's our whole life, <laughs> that was a lot. Now we, we have celibacy seminars, we have uh, discussions and, um, uh, on uh, chastity and everything. So uh, it's really pr promoting a very healthy, balanced uh, culture in the seminary. And integrated, I would say, yeah. too, because of those four dimensions. We used to call them the four pillars now. That's called the four dimensions. You know, the human uh, dimension, we give it as much attention as the, the spiritual, the academic, and the and pastoral. And by human, um, of course, the humans. We don't ordain no non-humans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, no animals, no folks from space, nothing. Uh, it's, but it's more dealing with the psychological yes. and social skills. We want, yeah, that we want them to be balanced. We want them to be healthy physically, mentally, and emotionally. And mm -hmm. the human is very important because it is the bridge uh, into dealing with people. So that bridge can either be blocked by, you know, some type of uh, quirk or, or mannerism that you might have, uh, or it could be opened. And uh, so we try to work on some of the rough edges in, in, the, uh, in the human person. Uh, uh, and uh, again, that could be a block or it could be a bridge. So that's what we work on in, in that dimension. I, I think this is something important for, um, you know, folks to, to pay attention to. When most of our audience would be, would have been married and raised a family and, you know, grew in their love for their spouse. But they would also be aware that when they come to marriage, their rocks picked up with lots of rough edges. And that interaction sometimes with a bit of difficulty helps to smooth out the rough edges so that a man and woman can learn to fit together and they have to f smooth out the rough edges of their children but you don't finish that off by the time you're 17 18 years old it's uh -huh. part of life and we're always having to grow in those areas and then besides the human dimension then there's also there's the intellectual mm -hmm. where you know it's it's mostly doctrinal but it's also philosophical mm -hmm. and then we have some the pastoral pa some too. pastoral where we get them hands on um, it's more than than uh, being, um, you know, just going as an intern, it's actually they're at learning and people are learning from them. And then, of course, you know, we have the spiritual. So there's there's mm -hmm. all four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the, a retreat is built in the year, uh, uh, spiritual days, uh, besides a, uh, your choice of spiritual director. Uh, there's spiritual conferences uh, mm -hmm. from, the, from the house spiritual director, uh, as well as the rector. 
uh, gives uh, regular conferences. And then uh, in our seminary, uh, the, depending on what level, each priest is assigned to a dif different level, like first theology and second theology. And so on the days when there's not a spiritual conference or a rector's conference, then a priest then will deal with that individual class uh, in those conferences too. And usually there's sure. open discussion and dialogue in there. Yeah, and the bottom line we say, Father Mitch, is we want these guys to be normal priests because yes. the people of God deserve and want and need a normal priest who's also prayerful, spiritual, mm -hmm. but he's not weird. <laughs> we got we had enough of the weird priest out there. Yeah. You know, the, this is <laughs> That's the human dimension that they work on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the peculiarities. There might be some of you saying, so why are you three talking about this? But that's another issue. That's another issue. We got it. We were grandfathered. <laughs> <laughs> the the other, other thing, too, though, that you, you mentioned uh, of integration of Marian devotion and praying the rosary in Eucharistic adoration, uh, the three of us who came through in 60s and 70s for me uh, and 80s for y'all um, can remember, the, uh, and I knew seminaries who were kicked out of seminary because they prayed the rosary. We had to hide in the bushes to say rosary when we were in the seminary. Not only that, if you had a brief recover, you were labeled conservative. And so it was so weird. And we were in a, uh, we started off in a <laughs> seminary that was built by miraculous metal money, and we couldn't even say the rosary in public. So yeah. uh, that was the 80s. Thank God that seminary yeah. is closed. But uh, yeah, uh, it was a tough time to keep, you know, together. And we were lucky. We there were four of us seminarians of like mind, and uh, so we were sort of like an underground <laughs> church there for a while, in in uh, in the gulags. <laughs> yeah, agent saboteur. <laughs> That's why it's a healthier environment now yeah. uh, in the seminary, and uh, and they're promoting de devotion and promoting uh, lexio divina, and uh, which is which, what does that refer to? Lexio divina is uh, reading scripture. Uh, whatever passage you choose to read, uh, reading it twice, then meditating on that, that scripture passage. Uh, it could be active meditating, put yourself in the scene. I guess that would be more Ignatian. Ignatian yeah. uh, and, then, um, and then, which would lead to then quiet prayer, contemplation, and then you finish with a, a devotional thanksgiving prayer. And um, Pope Benedict XVI in his reign was a big champion of that, mm -hmm. of Alexio mm -hmm. Divina. It goes back to the Middle Ages or, or earlier. Sure. And, and uh, so the recapturing of that, of praying the scriptures, is, is a beautiful thing and is now being taught. And that's so essential for uh, young men preparing to be preachers of the gospel. Yes. That the gospel is not a professional book that you read about in a class and you go through your class notes. It needs to be the, the word of God by which God speaks to us and in our own prayer. And then we speak about that word of God to our people so that that word speaks to their hearts. Right. That's our goal. You know, and that's, you know, sometimes it was more of a class lecture on why you shouldn't believe this. Oh, yeah, that's true. right. I mean, we were in the seminary. They denied the divinity of Christ, the sacraments. It was Christology from below. From below yes. or under yeah. a rock. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, like even when homiletics, when we're, we're uh, g teaching the guys how to preach, um, we often say to them, you want to preach with authenticity that people know that you're not, you just don't know about the scriptures, but you pray the scriptures, you live the scriptures. So when you're preaching, it sounds like you know what you're talking about, not just academically, mm -hmm. but prayerfully, and that you're living this too. And you know, and I think you would be very happy, both seminaries spend time, uh, their fourth the uh, theology and our third as well, go to the Holy Land. Nice. Uh, and, nice. uh, and then scriptures, every time the seminarian comes back or a deacon comes back, they say the scriptures come alive with them. And I know you ran a lot of pilgrimages, sure. so you, you would concur. And also Absolutely. both seminaries, uh, uh, we uh, do uh, pilgrimages to Rome. Being a pontifical college, the, the rector wants them to be rooted in, our, uh, in Rome. So we, we take them to the various shrines and sites uh, mm -hmm. in the Eternal City and you as well. Uh, at the Mount. So uh, they have both uh, um, uh, 
associations. Yeah, you know, though I always object to calling Rome the eternal city. <laughs> 753 BC, come on, that's nothing. <laughs> Give me an old city. You're, you're talking to two Italians here, though, Mitch. I know, that may be, <laughs> but it's still nothing. Yeah. Jericho, that's 12,000 years old. That's an old city. 753. <laughs> so much for the Iron Age. Now, <laughs> but no, it is important to go to Christian Rome and see that that history and that rootedness of our church in that the, this eternal city, so-called. Especially the catacombs. Um, the guys love seeing the catacombs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good place. Now, this is uh, a very important work, and I, I don't think um, it, it can be uh, uh, overestimated. The 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 task of preparing these young men to enter into the service of the church is a positive. I think, you know, we, we see lots of decline of church attendance, a lot of decline from the 70s and 80s in knowledge yes. of church teaching. It's not that people reject it. They, they never it. knew it. Yeah, They never knew it. And, you know, preparing these seminarians to go out there with a willingness to teach the church, as opposed to what I remember in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that to be against the church, to, to contradict it, was considered a prophetic yeah. statement. <laughs> We're going to be courageous. We're going to say yeah. it ain't so. That's not that courageous because the world already says that. This, you're, you're, and you can move from trying to be a priest who evangelizes the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that other mentality, you can start moving into a priest who agrees with the world and evangelizes the worldly doctrines yeah. to the church. That is going on in lots of places, and um, I remember last year, you know, uh, some of the churches are just splitting apart, the other than, you know, the different denominations, they're just splitting apart as leadership denies the truth of the faith, and on morals and doctrine, they often go together, and these guys sound like they said, no, 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 that's the yeah. way of death. The way of life is Jesus Christ and his gospel, his truth. And that's a very, very hopeful sign. So thank you for the work that you're doing there. But you are also doing work here. Yes. <laughs> a little sideline for you, right? <laughs> so tell us about this new program that you're starting. Uh, it's called Catholic Blitz, and similar to what we did with um, Web of Faith, we answer questions, but the, uh, the big difference here is that you, each of us has one minute, 60 seconds to answer the question, and the other guy has his hand on a red button. And uh, so, so there's a lot of adrenaline. There's, yeah, we're on, we're on the cutting edge there. <laughs> yeah, well, wait a minute. Is there any, you know, something uh, electric shock in your seat? <laughs> You know, the chair all of a sudden just our gives producer. a jolt. Uh, <laughs> no positive or, or negative reinforcement in this point, what, no. <laughs> what is the penalty when you get We don't to come it? back. <laughs> 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 yeah. But it, it's, it's, I find it very interesting and fun because uh, when you're doing the, the, uh, the other format, we had like a half hour show. So it became more of a and it was, long it was, discussion. It was, yeah. you know, for certainly didactic, but especially like you mentioned with the young guys today, a lot of young people don't have a long attention span. No, t television a half trains hour, you to have a yeah, short. That exactly. is, the iPad and the iPhone, they did a study recently that a rat has a 12 second attention span, but because of the iPad and the iPhone with the continuous scrolling, we have now an eight second uh, uh, attention span. So it's been reduced because of this technology. Yeah. So who had 12 seconds? A rat. A rat. A rat. Huh. 
So, uh, so, so these 60. These aren't even dirty rats anymore. No, no, no these dirty are, rats. No. Not so the these ones 60 that you get second, uh, second um, answers. Uh, I guess now it will be also on the um, the compute the demand and um, and radio and, and, on demand. Yeah, and and uh, uh, and so it's going to appeal more for the younger people. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas our show, uh, like Father Tregilio mentioned, that uh, we, we we'd get into a discussion and it might have taken five minutes to answer a question because of the discussion, which the older people like because they like to hear the discussion, sure. um, but uh, the younger people want more of a. Uh, an instant answer. So, let's take a look at a clip of what you're doing. Uh, this is a, a question about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Welcome to Catholic Blitz. I'm Father John Tregilio, the Diocese of Harrisburg, joined by Father Ken Bergenti, the Diocese of Metuchen, New Jersey, and we're answering questions in less than a minute. Father Ken, we have a question. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. How can Mary be a virgin after the birth of Jesus? You have 60 seconds. Well, the term virgin means a lack of sexual intercourse with anyone. And the, uh, from the New Testament, we know the angel Gabriel visited Mary and announced that she would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, therefore, she did not have relations with St. Joseph in the physical way. Uh, we call that, uh, that, that announcement, the liturgical feast, is called the Solemnity of the Annunciation to Mary. Now, the Catholic dogma of the perpetual virginity of Mary states that Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of our Savior. So the act of giving birth does not destroy virginity, and, and that is the basis of that dogma. And so, therefore, she never had relations with St. Joseph after the birth of our Savior. That's it. Okay, 10 seconds to spare. Very good. Please join us again for another episode of Catholic Blitz. So, this Blitz, um, you know, the, using the term Blitz makes some of us East Europeans. <laughs> yeah. <kind of> <laughs> yeah. It's not a Blitzkrieg. <laughs> okay, just, uh, just so folks know, Blitz means lightning. So it's, it's okay. Uh, but lightning round. Yes. Yeah, lightning round. And this is, um, uh, how many of these are you going to do? Millions? Well, we did 75 this, this past one, and then last year we did 50. Wow. And uh, because we did 75 in one day, our producer says he's going to increase it to 150 next time. So, what does he think he is, Pharaoh? <laughs> I don't know. We're, We're going to take away the straw and then increase <laughs> the number more of bricks. bricks. More bricks. But uh, there are uh, questions that are written in by the viewers uh, to EWTN. Uh, so it's, we're trying to answer their questions, which is kind of nice. So they they take certain a uh, pool of questions and sure. give them to us, and sure. and that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I oftentimes am quite different than this because I get questions. People say, I just have a short question. <laughs> and I let them know, well, the question is short. That's not the problem. It's my answer that yes, goes on forever. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but this is a, a good discipline to have, you know, that kind of short answer uh, ready. And then hopefully a short answer that will stimulate more investigation. Exactly. Yeah. That, right. You don't know everything there is to know about, say, the virginity of Our Lady in you know, 60 seconds or less. And, and for you, it was 50, <laughs> 50 seconds. 50 seconds, you're yeah. Such a pro. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, to, it, it takes, there's more, but this can stimulate. For it's like right. an it's a, to whet their appetite. Yeah. 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 And, well, like you said, appetizers. Yeah. You know, that's... Because hopefully they'll want to look into the catechism, uh, read some of the, like, what the Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure and others had to say. Well, see, instead of calling it the Catholic Blitz, you could have called it the Catholic Lazy Susan. <laughs> you just have this tray of <laughs> Well, we don't want to sound like cafeteria Catholicism, though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You don't want that. No, <laughs> yeah, we grew up that. in that era. That yeah. Was, yeah. That was that's over then. now. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it sounds like it's little nuggets of uh, maybe the Godiva chocolate box. Ah, oh, there yeah. you go. How's that? That sounds better. Yeah, sounds better. <laughs> uh, or one of those fancy schmancy chocolates. I think, you know, to, to have that 
and to cover large areas that were so neglected. Um, certainly, uh, again, looking back in the seminary uh, of the 60s, and, uh, especially the 70s and 80s, doctrines about Our Lady were fairly much ignored. Uh, and a lot of priests didn't hear a lot, depending on where they went to seminary. But in some places, it was... Some didn't even have a course on Mariology. Oh, yeah. And now they do. Now they, now yeah. they do, but uh, yeah. before you had had, even like when Father Burgundy and I were in the seminary, you had, the catechism came out in 92. We graduated from the seminary in 88. Mm -hmm. Almost every doctrine and dogma was being repudiated in the seminary. So Jesus wasn't divine. He didn't institute the church. There aren't seven sacraments. There is no purgatory. There is no such thing as original sin. From soup to nuts, they were denying Fundamental everything. Option. Fundamental option, there is no mortal sin. But also, too, uh, not one papal encyclical in all the times we were in the seminary or, or anything that were ever used or discussed. Now, it's, it's mandatory that they, that they, they study the, uh, the, the, uh, the documents of Second We didn't even, we're not allowed to study the documents of Second Vatican <laughs> Council, you know. Now they do. And, uh, and getting back to the Marian, mm -hmm. Uh, a very good friend who just died, who had a TV show on here on the priesthood, Father Fred Miller. Oh, yeah. uh, he taught Mariology, and he taught it through Lumen Gentium number no. nine, uh, uh, with Mary at the center of the church. And um, and he he said you could basically teach ecclesiology, uh, you could teach Christology, all through Marian uh, uh, Mariology. Yeah. And that's how he taught his course. So uh, with all the the different heresies that you had to deal with, because the Marian doctrines preserved. Uh, the the Christos, uh, Christ doctrines uh, mm -hmm. on his divinity mm -hmm. or humanity, however, which was being attacked. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, we'll come back to this. I, that, that's something worth talking about in a, in a minute, but we have to take a break, oh. uh, which you do every 60 seconds. <laughs> I have to do it after 30 minutes. So we'll be back in just a couple minutes and continue talking about some of these very important issues. So please stay with us. speaking with Fathers John Tregilio and Kenneth Brigenti uh, about their new work of doing these one-minute spots about doctrines of the faith, their various issues of the faith. And um, we've been talking about this, the importance of this, especially in light of our own experience of having gone through seminary, I in the 70s, you in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, and, you know, we were talking about how, you, you've mentioned a couple times, that professors were, you know, inculcating the idea to deny original sin, uh, purgatory, devotion to Mary, uh, well, doctrines about Mary, that, yeah. that the study of Mariology was not included for any one of the three of us. None of us had that. And a lot of times, issues like, uh, grace and free will were for certainly, in my experience, psychologized. Um, there, there were a wide variety of, you know, things that happened. And I don't think that's unimportant that, uh, to understand because part of my own sense is that if you train seminarians to disbelieve Guys who had a, a, a felt call to the priesthood and mission, and you train them not to believe the things they're supposed to preach from the pulpit, the things that they say 
in the words of the liturgy. All the liturgies speak about Christ's divinity. Uh, that's pretty basic in our prayers. And you're undercutting the prayer and the meaning of the liturgy. At that point, one of the things I talk about in my book, Wheat and Tears, about the sex scandal, is that if you don't believe, but you stay in the ministry, you will not be looking forward to a reward from Christ when you die, but you will try to seek gratification in this life. I think that the loss of faith and rejection of our doctrine opened up a number of hearts to not accepting morality and being very willing to become immoral. Not in every case. Not that, by no means that that applied. Many people were very, you know, otherwise very traditional and very orthodox also, you know, did uh, crimes. But there is this sense when you lose the motivation to please Christ and preach his truth, that you can start giving yourself permission for a lot of misbehavior. And I think this is why at the resurrection of Christ, we see all these conversion stories. Christ confronts apostles like our professors, in many cases, not all, but in some of our cases, who didn't believe in the resurrection. The apostles didn't believe it. And Jesus, our Lord, had to convince them, touch me, watch me eat, put your fingers in my wounds. He had to convince the, the apostles when they're looking at him yeah. mm -hmm. that he's not a ghost and that he's real. And then when they're converted, they're transformed but he had to get them to the faith. And this is a very important element. Without that faith, it's easy to justify lots of misbehavior. Oh, I, I agree 100%, Mitch, because you know that old saying, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi, the law of prayer is the law of belief, is the law of living. The, the opposite is equally true, that bad theology, bad liturgy will give you bad morality. And we saw that in the seminary. And as you said, it wasn't. Physiology, uh, that too. Yeah, it, it wasn't exclusive, but the, the the disrespect and irreverence we we would see in the in the sacred liturgy, the denial of sacred truths, mm -hmm. lends you to be misbehave because if you don't have to believe what the church teaches, if you don't have to obey the rubrics, then you can misbehave at the moral level. The one seminary we we both were at it's now closed. Uh, the uh, pr uh, priest professor taught the Trinity class, and he said uh, his objective, he, right in August when we started class, objective and goal was to have us doubt about the Trinity. That's what's what he wanted at the end of the course. Yeah. So this is what we were dealing with at the time. He didn't even yeah. believe in the physical resurrection. It was a moral resurrection. Yeah. yeah. And you know, what is what about St. Paul? You know, if he, Christ isn't risen, then you know. So when you remove. We're the biggest fool. <laughs> when you move God out of the center, then you're gonna move a lot of isms in the center whatever that ism may be, alcoholism, materialism, you know, et cetera. So, uh, and that is, uh, you could see <coughs> by them just trying to do, they rounded a tavola rasa, a blank slate. And of course, Father Dragilio and I in another seminary, and we're all three priests now, uh, we didn't have the blank slate. Uh, we were critical and they didn't particularly care for us, right? <laughs> uh, because of that, so. Mildly. Yeah, <laughs> because we said that this is not right, you know, uh, and this is wrong, and, uh, and we were exonerated. It was so funny, that same community that eventually the seminary closed, they were, all these professors are out of work, and when I first became uh, vice rector the first time around at the Mount St. Mary's, uh, I think they were cringing because uh, they, um, when I left that seminary, they, they, they gave me the caption to that, he's fitted only for a priesthood of the 18th century. And now I'm the vice rector working in the seminary <laughs> and they're all out of business. So that was like divine justice right there. You know, you've got a pretty wide grin on your face. <laughs> <laughs> You're enjoying this a lot. Oh, a lot. <laughs> you too, right? Oh, I absolutely, I, I don't deny it.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, the, the, there's, <laughs> you know, the, there's this certain uh, delectatio morosa. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. But it, it's, um, you know, this is something that um, we also have to be careful that we don't, you know, just sort of rest in that, ha ha, we were right, you were wrong. No, but that, that's not the point. The, the, the point that we all three of us uh, see in the development is preaching the truth, truth of Christ, Christ yeah. means we have to become more transformed even from our enjoyment of their you know fall you know we have to you know constantly be more and more purified so that we become more like Christ that the truth of Christ is meant to prune us. That's how he describes it in John 15, that our union, we get pruned, and, and this is something that everybody needs, is to be constantly pruned of our own foibles and failings, um, and, event, and, and Christ's truth is the knife that cuts away that which is And the truth prevails. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and certainly, you know, uh, all three of us have the battle scars that we could show. I feel like Alexander the Great showing off his <laughs> battle scars. Yeah. You know, but, you know, the, uh, looking back, do you think it, it's been worth it to have stuck through Oh, absolutely. All the difficulty. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because as I say to the seminarians, I said, the more you had a fight to preserve your vocation, the more you appreciate it. Yes. Just like a couple has to work at their marriage, a priest has to work at his vocation. And the guys who would skate by not having any trouble, never had any, um, you know, uh, battle scars, don't appreciate it. And mm -hmm. so they're going to fold early along the line. And they, and they also can't deal with problems after they're ordained because if they've always just, you know, slid through seminary and then they get into a parish and uh, the parishioner didn't like them, well, they crumble <laughs> apart. We, you know, if we had a fight for our vocation, you know, and we continue to persevere. Mm -hmm. So, sure. yeah. So I think, I think the experiences we had in the seminary definitely helped us in our perseverance as, as priests, because we're sure. now coming on our 35th anniversary. Well, that's a good yeah. start. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not as many as, as notches as you. on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's only coming up on my 47th. Yeah. So it's a little bit different. Uh, not that much more. And they go by quickly. They do. You know, this is faster and faster. But the, the other thing, too, it's not only that it's worth it for our own vocations, but I also find that, you know, the perseverance with Catholic teaching and not the various theories of denying the faith that were proposed to us by many of our professors in seminary, that this is not just beneficial for our vocation, but what we're doing by teaching the faith here to the church, that there's that been some of that pruning and focusing on this is what's important. This is why it's important. It's why I struggled to, to hold these truths. And it's, it's important for us to share that truth in short forms or in longer discourses but to communicate the truth of the gospel uh, to folks today so that they have, as St. Peter said in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, reasons to know the reasons to believe and to believe reasons for hope that the world is taking away. They don't have reasons for hope. I do have to say, though, because of EWTN, we have a better educated uh, populace. Uh, because uh, both of us, we've yeah. been pastors. I've been pastor twice. You were pastor for, you know, 16 years. Uh, and in our parishes, we have people that actively watch EWTN and uh, have been uh, over the years, especially your scripture courses and, and all, uh, really come uh, to a very good knowledge. So there are our nucleus that we work with. And then from there, 
it, we, we spread out to the religious education program and all the other things that need to be brought in line, but it also made it easier for us to start a perpetual adoration chapel in our parishes, mm. and, and uh, which I found is the key uh, because um, you see the confessions go up, up, and up when you have adoration in the parish. So we had to add on more confession schedules and things like that, which is a good thing. Yeah. And we also had, product of that, I had two vocations to go into the seminary. One now is in the propedeutic year, and the other one is in college seminary. So the byproduct of adoration is also reviving the parish. Um, and, but I have to say, EWTN did a great job in helping instructing our parishioners. So they don't take things on face value anymore. They, yeah. they, like you said, they have to have the reasons behind it, and they want to be taught authentic. And they, don't, and they want their intelligence respected, <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, as, as what happened r right after the council, some priests were just telling people, what's the spirit of Vatican II, without explaining to them exactly what Vatican II said. So today, people, they know what Vatican II says, they know what Pope John Paul, they know what the Catechism says, and they don't want to be insulted. I, I think that's one of the things that did happen. A, a line that you had said in the first half was just sort of tossed out, but it was very important that you were told not to read the documents of Vatican II, correct? Absolutely. And I was never told not to, but our courses didn't have us go back to the documents, except when I was in high school seminary. <laughs> in high school seminary, my senior year, the documents came out. The council was over when I was a junior, and senior year, the English uh, documents were there, and we read those in class. Now, what, that was really, I was boring, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, you know, was a 17 year old kid, uh, but still, I learned that that's what's in the document, and I keep going back to what the documents say, and not, and I know a lot of traditional Catholics say, well, the Vatican II caused all this. It did not. It was what you said, the spirit of Vatican yeah. II that contradicted the documents of yeah. Vatican II. Well, I, I just finished teaching a, a course on the documents of Vatican II at the seminary, and I brought to their attention what Pope Benedict said. There were two councils, the original council and then the, council, the fake council, what was being reported in the press and what some of the liberal theologians were saying over here that the council meant or intended. And he said, you have to go to the original authentic council, what the documents say. Yeah. And, the, the, and, the, and all these uh, political agendas fall apart. And that was, that was one of the issues, especially in the 70s. It became more and more political. Liberation theology and other Marxist interpretations were used and sometimes flatly, uh, it's hard not to, to give this interpretation, they lied about the council, yeah. saying the council got rid of devotion to Mary, except for the whole chapter on Mary yeah. uh, in, in Lumen Gentium. It got rid, they- Got rid they, of Latin, they claimed. Well, it, and also, I mean, uh, we're going through a Eucharistic revival right now. Yes. But if you look at the percentage of those Catholics believe, it's down to less than 20% one of the polls came out. Well, we just didn't get there. Uh, it was, churches were destroyed. Uh, the Blessed Sacrament was put in a place that you had to have a GPS to find it. You know what I call them? Churches of St. Mary Magdalene. Yeah, <laughs> wherever they've... they They've taken away my Lord, Lord. and I know not where they put yeah. him. And the altar rail was taken away where we used to receive communion. Uh, um, even the, the, the vestments and the, 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 the tabernacle veil, the veils, all these symbols meant something. They were signs to people that this is something very special and holy. So we're wondering why we have such a, you know, a, a, um, a crisis in the Eucharist is that because of these spirit of Vatican II, which destroyed this, uh, our beliefs in the, in the Eucharist. And now we're trying to revive that and trying to bring it back. To use a term from the philosophy many of these people followed, uh, Jacques Derrida, that they deconstructed, mm. you know, 
the concrete realities of devotion and focus on Jesus. You know, uh, again, liturgists were saying, well, we got to remove the Blessed Sacrament because the presence of the Blessed Sacrament is a distraction at Mass. Static presence, yeah. remember that? Yes. And I said, well, if Jesus' presence is a distraction, who exactly yeah, is the our, main attraction yeah. here? Yeah. You know, I, but that deconstruction right. you know, like, affected uh, people's faith. And it sounds like the young men entering seminaries now want to know it. They want to know what the real faith is because they want to teach it. Exactly, because they want to put their lives out in the line. So, mm -hmm. you know, and so they're, you know, fully on board with Christ and they're on fire with Christ and they're ready to put their lives out there for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, which is truly inspiring. And yeah, so they want the authentic truth because they want to convey the authentic truth and save souls. Yeah. Yeah. Like when we were in the seminary, we were discouraged from spending time before the Blessed Sacrament because that was considered static presence. And as I was saying to our students at, at the seminary, Sacrosanctum Concilium makes it very clear there's different presences of Christ, mystical, but the, the uh, presence par excellence, the tum maxime in the fullest sense, is in the Holy Eucharist. So that although Jesus is present uh, in a sense in the scripture and in the, every time the sacraments are celebrated or two or three are gathered in his name, most especially, the document said, Jesus is present in the, in the Holy Eucharist. And there's nothing in any council statement, including Vatican II, that ever talked about the Blessed Sacrament as a static presence. They <laughs> no. made that I made it up. up. Right. That's fake doctrine. It's just not true. Uh, especially, as you were saying, people who spend time before the Lord find that He convicts their hearts of sin and they confess. Mm -hmm. He stirs their hearts to find a vocation. One pastor I met in Miami some years ago has Eucharistic adoration. The host in the, the, the monstrance is this large. Wow. It's, it's got to be a good, you know, like three feet across, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's enormous. And he said, I can't begin to control all the things our Lord is stirring our people to do. They start their own radio station, service to the poor. Our Lord stirs that up like he did with the apostles. This is very important. And one thing we always ask the seminarians, are you making your holy hour? Yes. yes. In our day, the holy hour was never even mentioned, except maybe a, in a disparaging way that, well, that's Fulton Sheen pushing that. But now we're saying to the guys, if you're not spending good quality time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, you're not going to be an effective priest. And let me tell you, when you're in a chapel filled with seminarians all kneeling, because we priests will sit <coughs> and kneel in the back, you know, for an hour before the Blessed Sacrament, that is inspiring. Yeah. Uh, these young men with their, their, their love for Jesus, listening to his voice in that quiet time in the adoration uh, is inspiring. Yeah. Young men who love our Lord, love his blessed mother, and know that they're loved by God. This is going to be the future of our church. Thank you for the work that you're doing to help guide them, inform them in that direction. It's, um, it's you know, we, I know we're in a rough spot still in the church. The, the aftershocks of the foolishness that went on during our time. But it sounds like these young men will be helping to be. And they're not all just young men, too. We've got some middle-aged and guys. One, I have one seminarian one year older than me, hmm. and uh, they're very uh, encouraging as well. Good, good, good. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Wow. So if you would join me in blessing our audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. May Almighty God bless you all and keep you and fill you with his joy and the hope that saves us. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son. the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we can bring this program, plus all these one-minute spots <laughs> on doctrine, that these two, I mean, we just squeeze this, these oranges <laughs> till there's no pulp left. They just get it out of them. 
but we can do it only because the network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you all, and thank you, and thank you, Fathers. Thank you, Father. Thank you.